Um, and I wanted to uh, spend my 20 minutes talking about a piece of work that we done for uh, the Food and Drinks Federation, the FDF, uh, on rules of origin. And this has um, become um, one of the key planks of the engagements, notably with EFRA, uh, on this issue, uh, and also on the wider question of how to mitigate as much as possible the impact of Brexit for uh, the food and drink sector, and also uh, um, uh, the seafood uh, industry. So um, let's just start here. Um, now, the, um, the imposition of rules of origin on EU UK trade is, is an often misunderstood but also um, very um, uh, 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 important factor in the management of the impact of the UK's exit uh, from the EU for industry. Um, we, we, we all talk and hear about hard and soft Brexits. Um, the reality is that this means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, the, and one of the reasons for, of, for that is that it's usually also very sector specific and very uh, company specific. So um, the work that we do with our corporate clients on uh, support for their contingency planning on Brexit usually tries to break down the issue into the channels of impact or the channels of disruption. And this includes a lot of the issues that Mike was talking here about NTBs, about um, so non-tariff barriers, um, customs processing, uh, labor tax. Um, but, but one of the key questions is, is tariffs. Um, and what, I, I, I suppose that the main question is how material uh, is the imposition of tariffs on um, EU UK trade after Brexit really is both you know o overall but also for your sector um, and if you you know the, the, the way we try to answer this question is usually to try to break this down into you know a most likely uh, sorry, a worst case scenario, a best case scenario, and a most likely case scenario. Um, and I try to kind of um, um, list all the current models on the future relationship that have been trailed so far. And, and if you actually look closely, at least on paper, um, uh, the intention is that, and the likelihood is that you won't have tariffs uh, on EU UK trade for Brexit, except for instance in the case of a no deal Brexit. But if you actually look closely on how these uh, different models work, you actually see that the um, that the 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 answer is a little bit more complex. And and it, it, this is because um, uh, all future relationship models that are based on a free trade agreement or on a conventional free trade agreement. So here we're talking about CETA and, and an FTA, but also indirectly also uh, uh, on the checkers plan of the government with the facilitated customs uh, agreement and, and uh, uh, the dual tariffs, his, 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 which I'm not going to get into it, and we can cover that later. But the reality is that accessing this preferential tariffs, um, or in this case, zero tariffs, uh, will be contingent on compliance with rules of origin. Um, now, rules of origin is an extremely complex and soporific uh, and abstract uh, 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 part of, of international trade, and I'm going to try to boil this down as much as possible and translate as much as possible into practical questions uh, for, for industry. I think that the simplest way of uh, of understanding that is that there are essentially the terms and conditions of a free trade agreement on how you can access the, uh, the preferential tariff treatment. Uh, in practice, it actually looks, uh, it, it works as details, uh, uh, locum content rules that your good needs to meet in order to be able to be considered as an originating product in your country, in, in your market. Um, there are two basic criteria that I'm going to get into a little bit more detail later on, uh, which is that products must either wholly originate, which means that 
in, for, for instance, a, a fruit, a, an apple that is grown in the UK would be considered as o, o originating, or um, that there has been sufficient trans uh, uh, transformations on the material used to produce a good in order to make this good be considered as originating in this market. Now, this all seems very abstract, but they do save a they do uh, uh, serve a, pr 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 purpose here. Uh, rules of origin are there to uh, protect the tariff preferences that you basically agree with your uh, uh, FDA partners, but also to encourage local supply, so local pro uh, 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 procurement. So in the fish industry here, or the seafood industry, it would be the catching sector that would be protected from unfair co or a competition uh, from, for instance, transshipment of uh, a, 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 a material via the FTA that has the lowest MFN tariff. I'm not going to get into too much uh, detail here, but this does create uh, uh, two, two basic implications uh, for, uh, for industry. This means that products that are produced with imported material uh, 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 in the UK might not be able to uh, qualify for preferential tariff treatment when exported to the EU after Brexit. And it also uh, means that uh, UK products produced with a mix of materials from both the UK, uh, the EU and non-EU countries might not uh, uh, qualify for preferential tariff treatment when exported to a future UK FDA partners uh, uh, as those who um, uh, Nigel listed uh, in his presentation. Um, so why does this matter? Um, it matters because the nature, the, the, the globalized uh, nature of uh, the UK food and drink sector and uh, 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 the seafood sector uh, means that uh, you're particularly exposed. Uh, um, Sorry. Uh, exactly. So um, there's also the fact that the UK um, uh, seafood sector does uh, uh, um, uh, 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 source its, its, its key materials, and a lot of these are po po politically sensitive ones for Brussels, uh, but also in the UK, uh, uh, from countries outside the EU single market or uh, uh, from outside the EU FTA. Um, network. Now, um, I've listed there the the um, the, um, the, uh, the methods uh, uh, which are used usually to calculate uh, 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 rules of origin or to actually determine if a product uh, originates in a country or not. And I've listed them more or less into the most stringent to the most lax uh, uh, criteria, um, and. What is clear from the work that, that, that we've been doing for, for our DFDF is that there's a huge prevalence of the most strict of these criteria, which are the wholly obtained one, for all the products that are trade, or for most of the products that are trade between the UK and the EU uh, in the seafood sector. Um, so in in the uh, particular case of the seafood sector, the wholly obtained criteria, because of a recognition that fish is usually not available on the, uh, 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 territorial waters, that uh, the, the key criteria here to determine whether a product originates in the UK or not would be uh, uh, the a number of, 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 of um, um, uh, um, um, issues related to the to to the vessel or the factory ship. So this includes the registration, includes crew nationality, includes the flag that you're uh, flying at the time of the catch, um, uh, and the ownership of the f of the ship or of um, the um, or of the company that owns the ship. Now, in, I'll just now move on from this abstract side, and we're going to look at how this actually looks in practice. And here I've I've um, I've looked, I tried to, to uh, select kind of a uh, emblematic uh, uh, product of uh, uh, the seafood sector in the UK, which is 
uh, a UK made deep frozen battered fish finger. Um, and I've tried to also um, uh, uh, follow as closely as possible the, and as realistic as possible the kind of supply chain involved in the production of this uh, good. And here I've also used, uh, in, in order to assess what the impact uh, of imposition of rules of origin on UK EU trade would be, uh, I have used two um, um, uh, uh, rules of origin pro, uh, uh, protocols uh, as proxy. So I've, I've used the PEM, so the PEN Euromed uh, um, uh, um, Convention on Rules of Origin and the uh, Rules of Origin Protocol of the EU-Canada Free Trade Agreements, which is what the EU sees as the most modern and the most ambitions of its, um, uh, of its Rules of Origin uh, pro, 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 Protocol. And as you can see there, um, essentially, you do have a difference on what uh, 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 a wholly obtained uh, fish in this particular case uh, would be. But it, it, it does stress the fact that if you're exporting a, f a, a fish uh, finger from the UK to the EU, that the fish material needs to wholly originate in the UK. The problem with that is that a lot of the fish that is used for, or that is imported into the UK in deep frozen um, uh, fish blocks, uh, and this usually comes from, you know, it, it, it depends on the, on, on, the on the variety of the fish, but cod is usually comes from China, Russia, uh, Norway, uh, uh, Pollock from China, the US, and Germany, and Haddock from Iceland and China, which, which means that if you were to apply either of these uh, 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 rules of origin pr protocols to EU UK trade, that n none of these, or the vast majority of um, the fish fingers pr 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 produced in the UK would not qualify for Hero uh, tariffs. Um, now, there are some policy flexibilities that government use uh, that government uses in in their uh, negotiations on rules of origin that can help part of the problem. Um, so here, I I, I, I I just outlined two of the key ones, um, which can also be a bit technical, but uh, then the, the, they are essentially widely used, I would say, the, uh, the first one in, in, in particular. So uh, the, the bilateral accumulation pro provision would allow uh, the UK to count, for instance, cod imported from Germany as UK content, and hence it would allow for the exported final fish and finger, uh, fish, fish finger to benefit from free trade, from, from, uh, from um, the, 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 the hero tariff. Um, on the diagonal accumulation, it, it requires the UK to have an FTA with the EU and with a third party in common. So for instance, if you use the example of Norway via EFTA, if the UK were to conclude an FTA with Norway, uh, and with the EU, they could agree on a diagonal accumulation that would allow the UK to use um, the um, uh, 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 cod imported from Norway uh, uh, as UK originating material and then being exported to the, uh, 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 the EU. Now, this last bit, so this last diagonal accumulation point here, uh, this is a, a uh, policy measure that has been developed uh, but it's not widely in use, so um, usually if you actually talk to EU rules of origin uh, negotiators, they, they will say that, of course, you can ask for it, but essentially you have to pay uh, uh, via other uh, co 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 commitments. Uh, uh, but even if you take these two fle uh, flexibilities into account, uh, the reality is that a lot of what is exported to uh, the EU right now would fail to meet rules of origin because a lot comes from countries with which the EU does not have an FTA in place. And essentially you would be reverting to uh, WTO, 
hemphant hairs, uh, which in the case of fish fingers, I think it's about 2.2% or 2.1%. So this leaves us with the question of how to create new flexibilities. And this is an issue that we have also been working with the FDF. Uh, um, and the FDF has also been supporting EFRA in this case. Uh, and the question is how to create new flexibilities to mitigate as much as possible uh, this, this, this disruption. And here the choice of the rule framework is key. Uh, we talked about uh, earlier, at least Andrew did, that there is an inclination uh, in government to think that joining the, the PEM framework, so the PEN European uh, 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 the pen Euromed uh, pro 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 protocol would be a good solution. Uh, the problem is that uh, the PEM does very little to address the specificities of uh, 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 the vulnerabilities of uh, the food and drink sector. Uh, it does leave a lot of, of the current trade exposed. So then the question is what else can the government agree and uh, what we uh, kind of we, we've, we've been talking about is basically to try to agree on a CETA-like protocol with British characteristics. Now, because the PEM is a protocol that is shared by about 17 other countries, if I'm not mistaken, the PEM, if you join PEM, you take it as it comes. There's no of possibility for you to actually create new uh, policy mitigants uh, to address the specificities of, 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 of the EU, EU, UK trade. So then the question is how to replicate whatever the PEM has that works uh, into a new protocol, uh, but also with the added flexibilities that are needed to address these um, the, the, the disruptions. Um, now, I would just like to close now by, by talking a bit about the implications uh, for business. Um, I think that uh, one of the key points is that uh, this picture does confront uh, uh, UK businesses in the uh, food and uh, drink sector, but also in the seafood sector, uh, with basically three choices. Uh, the first is to um, restructure their global supply chains uh, in order to meet these rules of origin. Um, the second is to attempt to absorb these added tariff costs uh, 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 that are a result of being excluded from the, uh, uh, the preferential tariffs agreed by the UK and the EU. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, it's restructure their EU and UK operations uh, 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 to avoid any cross-border trade at all. Um, and I think that none of these are actually um, all that interesting. Um, so what's unique about Brexit, uh, unlike other issues around FTAs uh, and rules of origin, is that uh, usually on an FTA, uh, you are given the choice to adapt and restructure your, your production uh, 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 to access these preferential tariffs and hence new markets. So there's a counterbalance here. Uh, on the rules of origin question for Brexit, it's about um, uh, facing business with potentially costly restructuring costs in order to maintain the current market access that, that, that you have. So it's about minimizing losses rather than maximizing profits in the case of Brexit. So. For business, what does that mean? And I think that, that there's basically three points here. One is that you need to know your exposures. You need to know what are your alternative sources of supply. You need to know uh, of your suppliers which ones have FTAs with the EU, and hence you could find a existing solution to your uh, exposure. Uh, what uh, suppliers uh, so what markets uh, 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 will have FTA with the EU? Uh, but most importantly, I think there's also um, a question about engaging with, biz uh, with government, and, and this can be done via 
via your trade associations, but also if you have a, a particular problem with uh, or a particular exposure that you think is not um, uh, shared by your competitors, I think that it's engaging constructively with government to try to to, to, to make explicit what the, the, these exposures are and also come with policy solutions to try to support DEFRA and, and BASE on, 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 on how, to, how, how, how to overcome these challenges. I think that's it.